I just want to start off by, by thanking the AIC and thanking Adam for this opportunity to talk today. And it really, um, I wanted to emphasise that as well as this being a chance for us to tell you about what our research team has been doing and thinking over the last two or three years, we also uh, really wanted today to be the beginning of a discussion where we want to engage with people from different sectors, different researchers, policy folk, practitioners and so forth and to, to think more deeply about some of the issues to do with child pornography or as, uh, as our team prefers to call it child exploitation, exploitation material. Um, <coughs> just uh, very briefly to talk about who's in our team at the moment. We'd like this to expand but we've got a professor of criminal law and sentencing Kate Warner and um, Caroline who's also at UTAS with me. She's actually um, She's a psychologist. She did her PhD in sex on sex offenders. Also at UTAS we have um, Christopher Lurk, who's a professor of computing. And Paul Waters at the University of Ballarat, he's been a key figure right from the start. He's the research director at the Internet Commerce Security, uh, Commerce Security Labora Laboratory. Um, <clears throat> those, the five of us today, uh, the, uh, to date have been working together in different ways. Today there are, are four main things I want to cover. It's just first to set the scene. What is child pornography, uh, child exploitation material? How much is there of it? That type of thing. Then I, I want to be ambitious and in the second part of the presentation to try and lay out main features internationally of the law policy and research framework in this field. And I want to pose the question, uh, do we need to be doing more, thinking more, about demand reduction strategies and I'll get back to what I mean about that um, later on. In the third section of the presentation I'll give you a sense of the type of work that we've been doing. Some of it's been quantitative, some of it also has been really kind of sociological analyses of parts of the internet and then in the conclusion we'll, uh, I'll move towards um, thinking about implications and ways forward for law policy and research agendas. I'm not going to read that out to you, so I, I, I just want to start off with some, with some um, core um, um, features or characteristics of child exploitation material. Um, the, legal, the legal definitions um, vary between states and territories and uh, between countries, but in general we could say that, that um, child exploitation material refers to um, obviously uh, generally sexual material relating to children, uh, uh, people under the age of 18. Um, it is an offence uh, in some pieces of legislation. Child exploitation material encompasses what you might loosely call literature, which is a very generous term, I think, to mean just any writing about, fantasising about child exploitation material. And it also covers um, fake or morphed images of, of, of children. But in the main, uh, watch out for potentially for red herrings. In the main on the internet, we are talking about the bulk of uh, child exploitation material involving real children, real photographs, real footage of actual uh, events. <coughs> There's various scales to categorise um, this type of material, but it ranges from on the lightest end, mildest end of the scale, semi-nudity, right up to rape, bestiality and torture. And I'm sad to say that it involves uh, children as young as newborns. Um, and what is one feature to think about that is, is quite important in this field is that although, I'll get back to this point later on, although we are kind of talking, we're talking about a market, has lots of features of a market, <coughs> Excuse me, getting over a, a good old Tasmanian cold at the moment. But <coughs> the bulk of the material is produced and distributed for free. What is going on there? Why do people uh, feel um, motivated to not just abuse children, but to record evidence of it and then to put it on the internet to share it with others. And why do others want to share it? We don't know much about the psychology of this market. There's an awful lot of work to do, but I'm going to have to keep within scope and um, make sure I don't get off track. 
for the aims of my presentation. I might not be able to go into that, that uh, market psychology so much today. What do we know about the prevalence of child exploitation material? Well, one thing is unanim uh, kind of universally accepted, and that is that with the advent of the internet, this market has boomed. <coughs> the, our mining boom looks like it might be coming to an end. The child exploitation material ma um, market w is, has no signs of petering out. Um, for years we've had indicators of the strength of demand. Um, for example, something that was reported in the, press, in the press years ago was that there was a website that only operated for 76 hours and had about 100 um, SEM images and it received in that period about 12 million hits with about 3,000 coming from Australia. I think the, the best quantitative work that's been done to date um, to try and measure the scale of, of this market on a part of the internet just focus on peer-to-peer -peer, uh, websites. And um, it, this uh, study led by Hurley and her team um, uh, measured uh, took uh, uh, various measurements at two peer-to-peer -peer websites on a daily basis. They, they estimated that they could uh, d d distinguish about two and a half million distinct peers from a hundred countries um, and that there's something like 10,000 what they called files of interest being trafficked per day. Our own research that we'll get, uh, I'll get back to in more detail later on, uh, was, 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 a bit more, was much more modest. We also focused on, on a peer-to-peer -peer network. This one, the one that we looked at was called ISO Hunt, which is a very popular uh, international peer-to-peer -peer network used for file sharing and that type of thing. We, we measured the top 300 search terms over a three month period. It was just ordinal data, but we found that over that period, there are 162 terms that lasted that whole period. And we called those the persistent search terms. Most of them are related to um, music and movies and software and that type of stuff. But 23 of the 162 were related to sexual content. Most of that was, um, 19 of those categories was mainstream pornography and various sorts of it. But we found three persistent um, child exploitation material search terms. One being, the most popular being PTHC, which stands for preteen hardcore, unambiguous, um, um, term entered, you know, with fairly clear motives, and it was also a search term related to bestiality. So, so far we've been giving, we've been trying to get a sense of, you know, how big it is on the internet. Now, just very briefly, I want to just think for a moment about the national scope, and also draw us into thinking about the criminal justice system. And there's a lot that could be said here and we don't have time for it, suffice to say that um, uh, there certainly are uh, many cases being dealt with per year um, in all of the jurisdictions around Australia and they're, uh, they're uh, dealing with, with prosecutions of child exploitation material. Um, and so now it is a fairly consistent feature of our criminal justice systems dealing with people for these types of offences. So this is from this is one of the, the best bits of data I could find because it was by the, it actually tells us about people. It indicated in 2008 there were about 100 people who were prosecuted in local courts for child pornography offences. And this was by a, uh, from a particular report produced by the Judicial Commission of New South Wales into the sentencing of people for child exploitation material. If you have a look at the Commonwealth DPP annual reports, you'll find that um, in the last financial year, 11 to 12, there were 700 charges laid under the Commonwealth Criminal Code. So now, you know, again, loosely, kind of relating to prevalence, we can see it's a pretty consistent feature of our criminal justice landscape now. Okay, all right. Now, to, to bring us now into the policy and research and legal framework, I think we have to stop and stop for a moment and think about the scale of crime on the internet and, and note just how big that is and the features of online crime which make it very difficult to tackle include the rapid evolution of technology. That is such a problem because our legal definitions are written to refer to 
the internet or technology that operates in a certain way at a certain point in time. Our law enforcement, agents, uh, 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 law enforcement agencies have strategies that relate to technologies um, that exist in a certain point of time. And as we all know, technology changes significantly, very quickly. Um, I mean, there are significant changes that happen every six months, 12 months. And that can mean that law enforcement agent strategies are suddenly outdated. They're constantly feeling like they have to play catch up or our uh, criminal laws are outdated. Um, so that's a big problem. Then of course, some obvious things, the decentralised and organic nature of the internet make all sorts of online crime hard to tackle. The fact that the players, the, the, the stakeholders, the victims, the offenders, law enforcement agencies can be anywhere in the world is a huge problem. And then from a, a lawyer's perspective, the fact that you can have overlap of public and private law also presents different challenges. Uh, in a nutshell, for what we need to recognise for today's discussion is that online crime is this big, it's huge, it's huge varieties of it. There are uh, various types of uh, sexual crimes that, uh, uh, that we see featured in the internet, uh, human trafficking, the grooming of children for, uh, by pedophiles to try and meet children and to establish relationships with the purposes of perpetrating face-to-face -face off uh, offences. And then as a subcategory of that, what we're focusing on today is child exploitation material. So, of course, the policy development in this field is going to be complex and it needs to be intelligent and cognizant of the fact that there's lots of areas that, uh, that overlap with it. Talking ab about legal and law enforcement agency responses, I think it's, you know, uh, uh, we should recognise that that these uh, agencies lead the charge in naturally in supply reduction strategies. So um, our state, territory and federal law enforcement agencies cooperate with each other and with other agencies internationally to uh, try and detect and prosecute people for producing, distributing or accessing child pornography. There are around the country and around the world various specialist units. Um, two examples are the crime and misconduct Commission's EGRIT team, I think that's still the, the name they have for that team. And then of course the uh, AFP's child, child Protection Operations team. One of the huge headaches they have at the moment is how to respond to the trafficking of child exploitation material through the dark net, which has various different terms and meanings. But you would have heard of, for example, the Silk Road and the, the trafficking of drugs on the dark net. Well, similarly, there's a problem there so far as child exploitation material is concerned. All right, now what about research? And here again, I'm being very ambitious and could easily be um, <coughs> accidentally uncharitable to, uh, to the uh, researchers that have um, done uh, so much good work to date. Uh, but all, all I intend to do is to give a mud map of what the types of things have been done. My point is, before I get into these specific issues, naturally or understandably, the research is focused on the heavy end. The people with uh, high frequency diets, as a term they use, of child pornography. And the link between uh, heavy consumption of child exploitation material and face-to-face -face offending. So there have been, Tony Crone among others have, um, develop profiles and typologies of SEM offenders, people who only access SEM, people who access SEM and commit face-to-face -face offences, etc. They've looked at the motivations for viewing SEM. They've looked at, as I mentioned, the relationship between SEM and face-to-face -face offending. And then, of course, they've spent, you know, psychologists and other uh, allied health professionals have weighed in to figure out, well, how do we treat people like this? Um, if they're sentenced, what can we do to rehabilitate them? and reintegrate them. Great work, utterly necessary, but I don't think enough has been done at the light end. Um, having worked here um, years ago at you know, one of the world leading research centres so far as uh, the drug crime nexus is concerned, now I'm, I was very used to that idea of trying to examine the trajectory of a criminal career and or a 
the, the behaviours concerning uh, drug taking, the escalation of, of uh, drug taking behaviours. We don't have anything like that so far as child exploitation material is concerned. We don't know much about what happens when people make that first deliberate decision to look at a, 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 a piece of child exploitation material, which we call onset, which is just the same term that, that drug researchers use for the beginning of drug use. Um, we've got some, uh, a good deal of qualitative research that where some of the offenders say, well, I, my first decision was I really just did it out of curiosity uh, or it was impulsive. It seems as if also others have suggested, Taylor and Quayle and Beach have done an enormous amount of work in this area and they're fantastic writers. Um, it seems as if risk factors for onset for that first deliberate use include sexual arousal, so that makes sense in a way. That if someone, that, that since we know that when, uh, that risk taking behaviours are, in, are heightened uh, or um, more likely to occur when people are sexually aroused, that if someone's gone on the internet with the purpose of looking at mainstream child pornography, then they might be more inclined to take an impulsive look at SEM. And then of course that there's a variety of cognitive distortions which, may, which people may entertain. The old uh, criminologists or sociologists uh, from decades ago, Sykes and Matzer, would have called these techniques of neutralisation. Basically, a thought process you like to go through to make yourself feel better about something that you don't think is right. That, this one is a really critical one I'm going to get back to. <clears throat> there's no, even if I don't, I, 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 I don't agree with the abuse of children, but there's no harm in viewing child pornography. Um, another one is that distributing doesn't encourage th further production, or the A grade one, A grade cognitive distortion entertained by all sorts of people with pedophilic interests is that children are sexual beings capable of consenting to and enjoying sexual intercourse. The strength of that can't be undermined. There is all sorts of, I mean, under understated, there are all sorts of pedophilic subcultures on the internet. NAMBLA, the North American uh, uh, Man Boy Love Association or whatever it is, talks about intergenerational intimacy, talks about the fact that, that society just doesn't understand um, uh, that we're, we're, we, uh, if we fold out the enlightenment to its full extent, we'll understand that, that uh, sexual relations can be appropriate and loving between all ages. And quite um, polemic at times, I'll refer to people who are currently in prison uh, for child exploitation material as um, uh, political prisoners who are just, you know, because society just doesn't understand this. All right, so we've looked at at research and law and law enforcement agencies, well, what about policy? I think that the most relevant portfolio in Australia is, uh, falls under the Department of Broadband Communication and the Digital Economy. And this department has a massive portfolio, all sorts of things to do. And one part of it is its cyber safety plan, and they've got a good deal of funding um, to respond to and promote cyber safety. Now keep in mind that cyber safety is broader, encompasses child exploitation material, but is broader than child exploitation material. So what do they do with this? Well, again, we see the um, investment into supply reduction strategies, money for the AFP and the DPP. Um, there are uh, strategies to educate children, parents and teachers about the risks for children on the internet. And that includes exposure to uh, all sorts of deviant pornography, but nothing specific to SEM. There are reporting systems for children who can say, I've had this nasty experience on the internet, or I saw this horrible stuff. And then there are the uh, complex and um, slightly, con well, controversial uh, policies that relate to ISP filtering, different ways of trying to reduce the supply of deviant uh, material uh, you know, through a national net nanny or that type of thing. Again, another supply reduction strategy and then there are different um, uh, consultative groups and um, uh, working parties and so forth. There are other things that this department does. Um, 
uh, but I think those are the key features that are right to, to at least to point out today. I, might, I, I, I hope I'm right. I want to step back for a minute uh, over to the drug um, so, um, portfolio or platform just for a moment. And here I think a lot of us are um, just quite familiar with the, uh, the completeness of the harm minimisation policy platform. So that we have a mixture of policies that relate to s supply reduction, demand reduction and harm reduction. I don't think we've got that circle complete so where child exploitation material is concerned. I think yes we've got, we've got naturally we've got good supply reduction strategies going on. We've got the law enforcement agencies leading the charge in trying to uh, detect and prosecute people for, for um, producing or distributing that material. There are attempts but they're very complicated to also try and reduce the supply at the macro level um, through you know, how these, the internet works in Australia. And I think loosely you could say that the education systems for parents, teachers and children and the reporting systems kind of fall here in harm reduction. Although I note that it, as far as I can tell none of these education systems have actually been evaluated. We don't know what, whether they have any effect or not. But there doesn't seem to be anything over here. And I think that's because um, we've assumed that everybody's on board with the idea that looking at images of children being raped is uh, a criminal activity. And um, so that's a question I want to pose for now. Uh, is, uh, 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 is there a need for demand reduction strategies uh, to respond to child exploitation material? So I'll get back to that issue shortly. And now what I want to do is to move into the third, third part of the presentation, which is now drawing us into the empirical research that uh, my colleagues and myself did. Um, and here really what I want to focus on is what we have argued is evidence of the normalisation of child exploitation material on the internet. And what I'm going to do is to show you um, one particular website, which is a peer-to-peer -peer website called ISOHUNT. And this is the one that we studied. And I really want to try, uh, uh, it's worthwhile to see it to explain, you know, to, to, so that you can understand just how normalising um, some of these websites can be. Okay, so this is the web live now onto the internet, and this is the ISO Hunt front page. And look, I I am certainly not a Gen Y person, and I had to learn you know an awful lot of stuff about uh, about nuts and bolts on the internet um, in in the last few years. But these types, this is probably one of the ten most popular peer to peer websites in the world. And it's a great type of place to go to if you want to pirate material because it uses something called a BitTorrent system which means downloading stuff is very quick, very high quality and <clears throat> um, also, uh, well there's a few key things I want to, to point out here. Um, just look how kind of mainstream it is. You'll have um, adverts about games, You'll see adverts about anything from encryption methods, giving up smoking, insurance. There's a, admittedly, there's a lot of adverts about all the uh, attractive women who just can't find boyfriends, no matter how they look, how hard they look. Um, but it's not like it's not a porn website, is it? This is a very mainstream-looking thing. Let's look down the side here. Half a million people like, like ISO Hunt on Facebook. You can go and start to look for the various types of stuff you might be interested in by category. There's usually here in the middle, uh, Gary Fong or one of the administrators is talking about um, their various legal battles that they've been having in North America and you know, the importance of freedom of information and, and that type of thing. And there's forums and all sorts of stuff. They call, they say 
that they're a community. And in one of the uh, court cases that um, involved Isa Hunt, the court actually the, the, the court actually said that there was a conscious effort to, to, in, to generate a sense of community, which I think is important for subcultural uh, factors. You can buy a nice hunt T-shirt and all sorts of other stuff, key rings, etc., etc. That, incidentally, right, very low under there, it's very small writing, it says freedom of information. So that's, let's call that first click that gets you to the home page. Now, <coughs> You could go over here and try and see what would I like to watch or listen to, or you could see here, oh well, here I might click on the top, I might see what have been the, today's top searches, or the, last, the top searches in the last 24 hours. And you can see that at the moment there are about 30,000 people using ISO Hunt, um, and, and um, 200,000 plus people registered on it. All right, so if you click here, you're now into what's called the what we call the top thousand. Oh, yep, that should be. Oh, there you go. Wouldn't that be right? Um, it doesn't matter. I've got a backup plan, which is I just took a screenshot. Ah. All right. So if you get to the top one thousand, you'd you'd have text like this, obviously, smaller. It says "Welcome to the top one thousand." Here's a collection of stuff that's, that should be representative of what's popular in the BT, Torrent and IRC, if not the peer-to-peer -peer world in general. So they're really selling this and they call it the, the, uh, the ISA Hunt Zeitgeist or Zeitgeist, Zeitgeist, you know, the, the mood of the whole community. So you're thinking, all oh, right, well this might be a good way to find stuff out. And then you're presented with this long list of stuff, you can say I've just taken a little snapshot of it, that, that, that goes all the way up to a thousand. And there's music, Top Gear, pornography, um, Batman, Star Wars, um, it crosses generations, you've got Pink Floyd in there somewhere and <clears throat> other stuff. What else have you got in there? I just took this the other day. Same terms uh, keep appearing. Child exploitation, PTHC, preteen hardcore. That one's almost certainly linking to, um, to child exploitation material and Lolita is a well-known um, term that's used in that, in that scene. What, what we, when we looked at this internet, and, uh, this website and took it in, we started to think, okay, what are the implications of, of the way that that Sam is presented um, here. And we thought, well, at the most basic level, what you're seeing in that top 1,000 is, a, 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 is a, an opportunity for onset. That someone who might be looking to uh, find a good movie or, or you know, download something, <coughs> find a good uh, 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 TV program that they haven't you know, seen before, make their way to the top 1,000 and they might click on one of those things and then have the opportunity for on, on set presented. And it's a good chunk of the users uh, are very, you know, a young people, youth market. We thought it was quite significant that there was no, not even so much as a claim or a request, please don't traffic child exploitation material on this website or child exploitation material is uh, not endorsed by this website, something like that. I scoured the website and couldn't find anything along those lines. What I could find was that I think in the forums they certainly lay out rules about respectful dialogue and all that type of stuff and that people can get booted out of the forums if they put up pornography in general. But there's no statement, there's no value comment at all about what's traded in that top 1,000 because that's an automated system that they've set up. They're just showing you, it's an automated thing, they just show you what happens to come up as ordinal data in their top 1,000. So they are at arm's length from it, they feel. But I think that by not ma making any statement whatsoever, there's a type of acquiescence 
that could easily be misinterpreted, particularly by young people. If they've been told that this is, this is uh, um, um, popular information, and there's not so much as a squeak said about the type of information, I think that's a bit problematic. I think really what we're seeing is, is, is an ideological perspective of the internet and, um, and information, and this very strong um, uh, belief that, the, that freedom of information should be unfettered on the internet because, to quote the website, it is uh, good for culture and, and it's, 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 it's beneficial in all sorts of ways. I think that this overlaps with particularly the strong notion of freedom of speech that we have from um, the, uh, the, those folk involved in that website who come from America. But what it means is by overlapping these ideas of information and the freedom of it and the fact that it has to just have to let it go without separating out SEM, I think that it projects this idea to quote ourselves from one of our papers, the idea of child ex exploitation material as being an ethically neutral collection of zeros and ones. That is, that it's just data. And whatever's on the internet is just out there in the ether. And um, it doesn't, it's kind of, it's one thing to have abused a child, for example, or to commit any crime. But once something is data, then it is only data. And I guess, I guess we concluded by thinking that if, uh, that, that there is a, a potential that um, subcultural norms that develop on the internet, like on uh, websites like ISA Hunt, could influence um, the youth culture in general or young people or encourage some people to um, look at uh, SIM when they might not have otherwise. So we started thinking, um, gee, I wonder if we could, you know, could get some information on social attitudes to child exploitation material. We couldn't find any studies that had actually looked at this because, I guess, because like every, the rest of us, we'd, up until that point, we kind of assumed social consensus. So this year, just recently, we conducted a pilot study of <coughs> a survey of over 400 uni students. 70% were female, the average age was about 28, and we asked them some pretty basic questions. And I haven't got, we're still waiting for further analysis to be done in this field, but about 30 of the 400 odd um, university students didn't think it should be illegal to look at child pornography or uh, child exploitation material involving real children. One in five thought that it shouldn't be illegal to look at um, morphed images or fake images of child exploitation material. 10% um, thought that uh, whatever harms might occur in actually abusing a child, there's, it's, there's, there's, there's no extra harm perpetrated or committed or arises from uh, the, the viewing of child exploitation material. 7% didn't see any harm in distributing it. And a, a small number thought that most kids who are victims or unfortunate enough to be abused in front of a camera uh, might actually consent to and enjoy that activity. So the key point I wanted to make is, well, at least in this cohort of Tasmanian university students, you know, pretty well educated, um, young, uh, there was a minority, a significant minority, who disagreed with the criminal status of, of SEM or just didn't understand it, didn't get it and felt that there was no further harms caused by viewing child exploitation material. All right, well, that was just one study. Is there something weird about all those folk down in Tasmania? <laughs> I, I don't think so because just after we did that, uh, I noticed this. Now, this um, is the founder of the Swedish Pirate Party um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Folvinch? Folvinch? Folkvinch? Anyway. Yep, all right. 
So he's put out a, a the Swedish Pirate Party is all is is this I don't know much about it to be honest, but it's a it's a kind of political party that started in Sweden that really is largely driven by uh, young people who want reform in, among other things, uh, piracy laws. And um, uh, the founder just this year put out a, a, uh, this article, three reasons possession of child porn must be re-legalised in the next decade. Um, and why you need to fight for it to happen. If you go, this goes on for quite a way, uh, and then if you have a look at the comments be below, you'll see the, the types of sentiments that we had guessed at in our earlier publications. Basically that, oh, it's terrible to abuse children, but data is data. What uh, other things that were posed are, um, What's the difference, but why is it illegal to look at images of child pornography and yet it's not illegal to look at someone being beheaded by Al-Qaeda? That's a really interesting jurisprudential question. Um, so there's, con there's, there's a level of confusion and uh, uh, what would we say, dissatisfaction with, with the criminal laws. So I want to draw us to, conclu to conclusions with you know, some implications. I think the key thing that I want to emphasise today is that I reckon we seriously need to look at demand reduction strategies because we've got a disconnect between the views of some members of the population, probably in particular young people, who just don't get why uh, child, looking at child exploitation material ought to be criminal. I think we need to do a better job of of um, figuring out exactly in our minds what the harms are from a criminal law perspective in viewing child exploitation material and we need to clearly explain that to society. I, I think as the first point that I, don't, I question whether there is social consensus now about the harms of viewing SIM. Another good reason to think about demand reduction strategies so far as child exploitation material is concerned is that with any complex crime, as John Braithwaite said years ago, you cut at it from all angles. So if we could develop some new um, tools in the toolkit to respond to this, why not? Let's seriously think about it. Who knows, if we are clever about the demand reduction strategies, we could actually be affecting this market by reducing the number of people entering the market and ultimately, just as we try to do with the national drug strategy, reduce demand. So it makes sense from that market paradigm. And I think, thirdly, I would argue that demand reduction strategies, because they are sociological, admittedly they're long term, you're never going to get the, the types of successes or, or the that they're not going to work the same way as supply reduction strategies. But if you can invest into and think about demand reduction strategies, what you have is about, it, it, what you're relying on are social views, uh, about sociological strategies, which are parallel to, but not affected by, changes in technology. My point being here, if you get good demand reduction strategies going, it won't matter what the next what BitTorrent system is. We won't need to be changing legislation and getting law enforcement agencies to adapt their strategies. Do you get what I mean? So they are less vulnerable to this um, main feature of online offending, which is it's rapidly changing all the time. Um, because we're just dealing with people, talking to people, explaining to them um, why what we think is harmful about this type of material. I think that to start with my own discipline in particular, our Australian courts need to do a much better job of articulating what the harm is in child exploitation material. There's too great an emphasis in, we've looked at about 60 cases over the last decade, there's too great a reliance in sentencing comments on using the market paradigm. While I think the market paradigm is fair, I think that 
the, uh, the courts ought to be making references to the long-term impacts on victims, which I can describe to you later on if you're interested, and to, to the other aspects of this crime, which are more compelling reasons than, than, um, which, uh, uh, than a market paradigm. To put it another way, I think the market paradigm for the average person may start to get a bit weak because they know they're not paying for this stuff. And although the courts talk about, well, this is broadly similar to receiving stolen goods, I, I don't buy that personally. How can, you know, one person who's, who's you know, <coughs> tempted to look at child exploitation material, are they seriously going to believe that downloading one image when there's 10,000 traffic a day is going to somehow stimulate the market in any significant way. We need to get more sophisticated and clever and compelling in explaining what the harms of child exploitation, looking at child exploitation material are and why as a society, we need to figure out why as a society we don't like this. It's not something that we can just assume everyone understands. What is it that bothers us about viewing it? Let's agree on that, figure out the best reasons and then explain that to everybody else. Now, if, if the law was able to do that as a starting point, um, that would help with demand reduction strategies because these prosecutions are so high profile that whenever uh, the courts give sentencing comments, they are quoted by the media. And that is cheap, free, uh, broad scale public education going on. I think we need to also, so far as the law is concerned, iron out inconsistencies and problems in the law. I think that it is odd that the age of consent, for example, in the Australian jurisdictions um, would, would permit, for example, two 15-year-olds to be lovers, to consent to sexual relations with each other, and yet if one took a photo of himself or herself and transmitted it to the other, suddenly they've, they have distributed child exploitation material. That type of stuff has to be ironed out because we need a high level of public confidence in the law. And we don't, we, we need it all to make sense. And we want everyone to be on board and to understand what, you know, we're, we're driving at. And although that's a, a kind of slightly off to the side, I think that in the public perception, um, having a consistent, clear, rational set of laws that all make sense together is, is important. Okay, um, so this is the last slide. Um, I would like to float the idea that the uh, Department of Broadband Communication and the Digital Economy consider um, in its platform, in its, in, its, uh, in its array of responses, it could consider an education platform that deals specifically with child exploitation material. It makes sense to target this particularly towards people who are using the internet rather than the whole of the Australian population. And I think the really tricky point is to try and sidestep the whole piracy issue because that's an ideological debate that we just don't want to get involved in. I think it'd be very dangerous from a policy perspective for this to be, uh, for, for your people's views on child exploitation material on the internet to basically be determined by where they sit on the whole raison d'etre of the internet and the free flow of information. I think that we could consider, indeed uh, other agencies have tried this before, but I think we can get more inventive about pop-up messages on the internet or pop-up video clips, just giving people that moment to think, geez, do I really, I've entered that search term, do I, what am I going to be looking at? What harms are there involved to children in the production of this material? Similarly, other sociological strategies might include trying to find people who have high status in online subcultures, who are happy to champion the cause against child exploitation material, and perhaps using them to um, be involved in social messages or pop-up messages against child exploitation material. Why not approach websites like Isohunt and, and other, uh, other websites and just ask them? Guys, at least as a minimum, I understand you might not want to uh, edit your top 1,000 for philosophical reasons, your top 1,000 search terms, but at least could you put a prominent um, 
uh, message there against denouncing child exploitation material. I think we should um, consider uh, expanding uh, investment into online self-help systems and there are a couple of examples of that for people who have started to um, started a, a diet of child exploitation material and think far out, what am I doing? How do I break out of this cycle? And there are a couple of good examples that already exist in that space. And finally, what could researchers be doing? Well, I've actually you know, opened up a can of worms. There's all sorts of stuff we could be doing. Legal, sociological, empirical, theoretical, it goes on. I think some of the top things would be to um, try and determine what the risk and protective factors are for onset. As I mentioned at the beginning, I think we really need to figure out the psychology of sharing so that we can better, actually that would help with supply reduction as well because then we could better try and tackle the dynamics of the market. And I also think that as a final point, and as a bit of a boutique but serious issue, we need to have um, be looking at adolescent sex offending and whether um, uh, access to a child exploitation material <coughs> is an additional risk factor for um, um, sex offending by young people. Thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry I belted through that so quickly. <laughs>